great to be with you here today. I was driving to church this morning, coming up Garden Road. We don't live far away. And as I began to pull into the parking lot, I saw the flags for Shoreline and the sign coming in. And I thought, you know, that's, those are so nice looking. What a great church. And I walk across the parking lot and come up through the courtyard. And this is a beautiful courtyard. This is a gorgeous courtyard. There's so much good stuff that goes on in this courtyard. Come into the building, as you did today, and I noticed that lobby looks nice. If it's a cold day, there's a fireplace burning. Isn't that a luxury? Isn't that a wonderful thing? And come into the worship center, and it's, during COVID, we were able to do work in here to bring it up to speed and long overdue work. And we have, uh, we painted, we new carpeting, we just made it nice, and I thought, what a great church, beautiful landscaping outside. And if I was going to talk to you this morning about caring for the church with that definition, church, we'd be talking about a facilities team. We'd be talking about who paints, who cleans, who does the maintenance, who does the repair. That would be caring for that kind of church. But we're not talking about that this morning. We're talking about a different kind of church. We're talking about the body of believers united in Christ with the purpose of worshiping God and nurturing and edifying each other. Reaching out then as a, as a community to a suffering world that needs help, always. And the word church is mentioned over 100 times in the New Testament. The word used is ecclesia. It's a Greek word, and it means really a combination from, of um, assembly and the called out ones. The, assemb the assembly of the called out ones. And a definition of, definition of it might be this. The New Testament church is a body of believers that has been called out from the world by God to live as his people under the authority of Jesus Christ. You're the church, and I'm the church. Bill, you're the church. Bill and Sally, you're the church. Honey, you're the church. Brandon, you're the church. Monica and girls, you're the church. Did you know that you're the church? You're in a church, but you are the church. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. What are we called to do to care for God's people in the church? And we're fortunate that Jesus has given us a roadmap for this. See, he was the very first one to ever use the word church in the New Testament. The very first one. He said in Matthew chapter 16, and I tell, and I tell you that you are Peter, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. What he was saying was, is, well, this follows a conversation Jesus and Peter had, where Jesus said, Peter, who do you say I am? And he says, you're the Christ. So he tells Jesus who he is, and now Jesus tells Peter who he is. You're going to be a great leader of the church that I will build. He uses the word. And then Paul gives a powerful description in the book of Ephesians. He says, and God placed all things under his feet, his feet, and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body. We are the body of Christ, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So, so we know that we are the church, and Jesus is going to go on, as we'll see this morning, that we are instructed to care for the church this church. And he makes it very, very clear. So it's one thing to care for. It's another thing to care about. There's a real distinction between the way the terms are understood. For example, I'm a sports guy. I follow all kinds of sports, not all day, every day, but I check in. And I've been watching the Euro Cup soccer tournament. It's a big deal. And one of the games, a player for the Netherlands just went face down, had a heart attack. They had to bring him back right on the field. He's fine now. I cared about that. Meaning what? I had thoughts of caring. I had a, a sense of, gosh, I hope he's okay. I focused for a little while. I prayed for him. I cared about him. But I didn't care for him. I didn't go there and try to be available and see if he needed me. There's caring about and then caring for. Caring for is more about actions and words and behaviors as directed or as called to. And Jesus is teaching us that we need to care for the church, which is God's people. And he taught us that to love is to serve. To love is 
to serve. And we serve one another, and by that, people will know who Jesus is through us. He makes this remarkable statement in John chapter 12, and the context of this is they're at the Last Supper. And, and, and he's going to say this, I'm going to break it down for you, but he knows his time is coming. And he says this, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. What does that mean? The hour has come. He knows he's just a few hours away from finishing the meal, leading them to the Garden of Gethsemane across this short, easy-to-cross valley. He knows he's going to be arrested there, and he knows he's going to be brought to trial in Jerusalem, and he knows he's going to be convicted, and he knows he's going to be crucified. That's what he means when he says, the hour has come. So you see how it works? Like if he knows it's coming, then all the time leading up to that from this last supper to then is compressed. He's got a lot he's got to teach. He's got a lot he's, that he's got to remind them of. He says the hour has come. It's coming. And then he goes on to say, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. What's he saying? He needs to die to produce what has to follow. A seed needs to fall to the ground and be planted to grow the plant that will then produce more seeds. He's giving them a picture of what's about to happen. He's going to be the seed that dies and produces many seeds. And then he says, anyone who loves their life will lose it. While anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. He's not saying... Hate your life. Hate everything in your life now. He's not saying that at all. What he's saying is, if you are so invested in this life that it's number one in your life, you're in trouble. That's not what I came here for. That's not what I'm about to provide for you. That's not what we're talking about. And then he says, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. He doesn't mean... Go around just hating everything about your life. He's trying to make a point by dramatic contrast. He's saying, hate your life in the sense of don't make it number one. Enjoy it, but never make it more than it's designed to be in his kingdom. Keep him number one, that life, and you, you already have eternity. As we said recently, you already have a foot in eternity. That's the point he's making. And then he says, Whoever serves me must, here's the word must, follow me. And where I am, my servant will also be. That's where I want to be. Oh, that's where I want to be. My father will honor the one who serves me. And he uses the word must. We're going to come back to that. So we understand what the hour is. We understand some of the context of the hour. It's the last supper. It's all going to happen. He's saying... I'm teaching, there's things you need to know I'm teaching. And then he does the most remarkable thing. It stuns them. He assumes a position of a lowly servant in the room. There was no one there to wash the feet of the disciples, and foot washing had to happen. It's dusty traveling in that land I've been there. Foot washing was done before dinner. They recline at the table. You can see people's feet. It was part of Jewish ritual. It was done before people went to bed at night. Foot washing was huge. And he goes, guys, come over here. I'm going to do this. And they're going, what? They're talking amongst themselves. What's he doing? Get up. Like, what's he doing? What's he thinking? No rabbi would ever, ever do that. Ever. They didn't even have a plan to wash their own feet. It was just not going to happen that night. And he sits down or kneels down and he goes, here. And he washes all of their feet. He says, Judas, Judas, come here. I'm going to wash your feet. And he washes their feet. And he dries the feet of Judas. Okay. Judas the betrayer. And then he says, Thomas, come here. Thomas, the doubter. He washes his feet. Let me dry those off. Here. Peter. Peter the denier. Come here. Let me wash your feet. 
no, Peter, you need to let me do this because if you don't let me do this, I'll have no part of you. Okay, Peter says, wash all of me. Okay, you just have to get this, Peter, what I'm teaching you here. He did something that nobody in his position would ever do. That's why they were stunned. That's why he did it. Why didn't he just teach them by saying, look, you know, you got to do as I do. Here's, here's a melon. You get a melon, you get a persimmon, you get some grapes. Here's some stuff I'm giving to you. Why didn't he say, I got some cloaks, I got them clean for you. Here's a cloak for each of you. Why didn't he say, here's a plot of land outside of town. I've set it aside for you guys, paid for it. You can go grow crops and live there. He did something that humbled him. It put him on his knees in front of him. He, the one who was going to redeem us all and has done so. Doing something that just would have never been done. And why? Why, why, why? Because he taught with words already, but now he needed to show it. And not just walk through the motions. He didn't say, it'd be like if I washed your feet. He quietly washed their feet. They'd never seen it before. We need to experience that in our way today. He washes our feet and he says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, here it comes, you also should wash one another's feet. It's hard to hear must and should and should and must, but we need to hear it. You should wash one another's feet. He says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. He's referencing what he just did. You experience it. I didn't just talk about it. I did it. Now you do it. And right before he'd done this, when they were walking along that day, he had overheard them, as he had before, competing and arguing about who was going to be the next great one. Who's going to be great? It's going to be you. Not going to be you. It's going to be me. He knows this is happening with them. And he finishes this statement. He says, I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. These things, what's he saying? He's, telling, he's showing them and teaching them how to serve and love one another. He's teaching them how to be great is the opposite of what you've always thought and what culture has always said. It's upside down. Great isn't what you thought it was. It's all different now. I'm telling you a new way that greatness works. And maybe it's foreign to you, but you have to hear this. Now that you've heard these things, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So he's saying, should? He's literally giving them their marching orders in the last few hours. He's literally saying, these are should and must and do and love. You've got to do these things if you're following me. They aren't suggestions. They're not hints. He's not talking in an abstract sense. He's not talking about feelings. These are your marching orders. You're going to follow me? Here's what it looks like. So what blessings would he be talking about? Well, I know what it, how it works for me. When I do the things that I see are mine to do for his sake, when I'm serving others, I get a great feeling inside. I call it the inward smile. I was like, oh, that feels great. But you know what else happens? The people you're serving and helping now know unmistakably that they matter to you. They matter in the demonstration of serving, loving as Jesus does, did and still does. They know they matter. Words alone, you can tell someone, you're really important to me, you're really important to me, you're really important to me. Wash their feet in some other symbolic way not just foot washing, serve them. And then words connect with the actions. That's what Jesus is doing here because of why. It's about serving others, getting outside of ourselves. Jesus called them together and he said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. He's saying, this is how the system has always worked. You know how it works. Then he says another counterintuitive statement. He says, not so with you. You, you're not them. You're with me. Not so with you. They're going, oh, 
wow. Okay, there's a whole new way of being and doing things that's being rolled out by him. Not so with you. Instead, again, they've been arguing about who wants to be great, who's the next greatest. He says, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must, must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. What? Those are almost crazy words. What does this mean? Except we know who's teaching it, so we know it means something we need to get. And he finishes, he says, for even the Son of Man, referring to himself, the Messiah, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Why did Jesus do what he was called to do and born to do and prophesied to do? Out of love. God isn't loving. God is love itself. And then he's loving. It was a gift of love. By grace you were saved. Grace is unearned love. That's what we live in. That's what we live in. And Jesus says, I'm going to give the greatest act of love through serving you this way. And because he did, we are saved today from that single act. And he's, he's making them look at this and face this. So now we've heard these teachings. And I, I was going through this, putting together, saying, boy, I, this is striking me a whole way that I've not recalled before. I mean, this is moving me somehow. I, this is good teaching from Jesus. But what's next? What's next? So I'm going to refer you to Verses in James chapter 1, because we often go to this verse, it's so helpful in our walk. And in James 1, 22, 24, it says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Those last two lines, I was thinking, man, I wish that would happen for me. <laughs> Maybe some of you know what I'm talking about. But what's he saying? We've got to unpack this. this is, there's more here than we might have thought. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Why would he, how does deception come in if you're just listening to something? Because what if you're listening to the words that say, now go and do this, and you don't do it? That built into the teaching is, listen to this and do the things we're teaching you to do, and you don't do it. You have now deceived yourself. Into what? Into believing you got what all there was there. I got the teaching. It's good. Thank you. I'm leaving now. That is self-deception, is what he's saying. That is self-deception. You got to get the whole thing. You were taught to do this, and now you must go to do this, or the teaching is incomplete, and you've fallen into self-deception. Do what it says. That's an imperative. We have should, should, must, must, and now do it. That's a call to action. It's a command. It's not a feel like doing it. Try and get the feeling up. He's not saying that. So we know that we need to see serving as loving. Jesus makes this very point. Caring for God's people is loving the way Jesus loves. So here, we're the, here we are at the dinner, the Last Supper, and Judas leaves. He's doing what he knows he's going to go do. He's going to engage in the betrayal of Jesus. After he leaves, Jesus says this. A new command I give you, love one another. Remember, he doesn't say feel a lot of love for each other. He says love one another. As I have loved you, so comparative. This and now that, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. We've got to see what's in here. Let's unpack this. A new command. There's the word command. We have should, should, must, must, do, love, and a command. Remember Matthew 28, the Great Commission, all authority under heaven and earth has been given unto me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, and then what? And teaching them to obey, or baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Command. It's a command. It's not an option for a believer is what he's saying. He's saying love one another. Then he starts the next, the next sentence with the word as. 
Let's just see the word as up here, and let's look at everything underneath the word as. Here's what he's saying by as. He's saying, do you recall all the stuff you witnessed and were part of in all this ministry with me? All the way up to you in Mark chapter 6 when I commissioned you to go out and throw out demons and heal, and you did it. Do you remember the long walk? Do you remember Samaria? Do you remember all that? Do you remember the way I, I healed and tossed demons out and, and did great miracles? Do you remember all that? All that's under the word as. He's saying all the things you've seen. Then he goes on to say, so you must love that way also. First, you love one another that way. In the community, the body. First, we love one another. What would it be like if at Shoreline we did it the opposite? We don't love each other much. We're not into it. But boy, are we happy to love the people that live over in Prunedale. We're going to love on them, but not here. How bizarre that would be. There's no witness at all to that. There's no testimony at all in that. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, he's saying, as you do it, once you put it into action, you're loving the way Jesus did by serving. As you do it, people will see. They will see and be moved like, what's going on here? Something's happening here. That's remarkable. Oh, that was helpful. How kind. This is what they'll see. And then he says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Then he says, if you love one another. So what we get from this is a number of things. One is caring for God's people is loving the way Jesus loved and still loves. Serving one another, especially in the body, is a way that we love as Jesus loved and a way that honors the commission he's given us. So the love Jesus speaks of is a combination of these things. There's caring, which displays kindness and concern for another person, displays. In other words, I care about them. Yeah. Are you caring for them? Two, it's tangible. There's an outcome that can be known and experienced, that can be seen, that's an evidence. Three, it's noticeable. It's clear or apparent. Four, it's memorable. Easily remembered. It's special and worth remembering. And it's repeatable. It can be done over and over and over again in like and different circumstances. And it's learnable. Anyone can learn to do it. In my couples counseling that I do, often I teach people how to do caring behaviors that they haven't done before. And they learn it. They learn it. Loving the way Jesus loves is learnable, which also means it's teachable. If it can be learned, it means it can be taught. And then it's remarkable. It's striking, extraordinary, counterintuitive, and supernatural. Now, some of you are thinking, well, but what about the invisible stuff you do? I mean, shouldn't you do stuff and not let the right hand know what the left hand is doing? Yes. I take my big high-powered leaf blower out in front of our house, and I blow the pine needles off our stretch of the private drive, it's a small drive with four houses on it. But my neighbor, Steve, next door, he's got a bunch on his. So if I'm out there, I just walk over and blow all of his off. But I don't go, when I'm done, go, hey, Steve, Mary, get out here. I want to show what I did. That's right. I did it. And you need to be thankful and humbled by my gift of service. I don't do that. He, to this day, probably doesn't know, how did that doggone thing get clean when I drive up? doesn't matter. You know what? That's not what Jesus is talking about here. That isn't what he's talking about. He said, by this they will know. That means there are actions that can be seen and experienced and others can see it. Now, you're not going out to do it saying, there's a crowd. I got to find something to do really quick that's service-oriented so they're all moved to follow Jesus. It isn't pre-planned as much as pre-prayed for. And your openness to the opportunities to serve. Here's the last word that really kind of got me stuck in John 13 that I quoted before. It's the word if. The word if. What does that mean? It means there's choice involved. If you do them. What if you don't? We're free to choose. Our Lord loves us enough to give us free will. We can choose. You can be a churchgoer, a church attender, part of the church and all that, and still choose not to do any of those things. Why? Maybe for whatever your reasons are. I don't know. You can, you can choose not to do it. We have free will. No one's forced to serve 
another. No one is forced to love others in the church. Nobody's forced to do that. God loves us enough that he wants us to want to serve, and that's sometimes where I get stuck. I got to tell you, I get stuck. I've been a therapist for 40 years, a pastor for almost, well, 20 and a half. I love to, I love to give, I love to care for other people, but there's times I just don't have it. I, I, I just don't. I just don't. My mom is in a memory care facility down in Rancho Cucamonga. Raise your hand if you know that town. Ah, you've been there. It's in the foothills of the, of the San Gabriel Mountains there. My mom's in memory care because it's gone. The dementia's gone. Now I learned last time I went down, she doesn't even know me through the glass doors. But she does that, care, that covering behavior that people with dementia do. I said, Mom, it's me. She goes, well, yes, it is. Hey, hey, good to see you. I know she's going, who's that? And then I know, I take her to breakfast. I meet with my stepbrother, Gary, and his wife, Viv. They're wonderful people. We go out to breakfast. We do a little shopping. We leave. I know that two minutes after I leave, she won't remember that I was even there because when we drive in the parking lot, she doesn't even know she lives there. So I do this turnaround trip that's crazy. I wake up at 1 in the morning on Saturday. I drive down because I hate L.A. traffic. I just hate it with a passion. It's worthy of my hate. <laughs> I'm just saying. Amen? Can we get an Amen. Ah, so I go down so I can blast down there. And then I blast back. I do the whole thing in like 12 hours. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. But it's the right thing to do. So I do it. How do we create the want to feeling? How do we do that? What if it doesn't come to you naturally, but there's something you feel like, I ought to do that, but I just don't want to. What do you do? Sometimes we just stop and don't do it. Well, it must not be, and I guess I can't. We'll have to let someone else. I don't think we can live there. I had a mentor in the town of Wairika, California. Raise your hand if you've been to Wairika. Do you know how they got its name? They put the lettering wrong on a bakery 100 years ago, and they left the B off. If you read it backwards, it's Wairika. I'm just saying. My first Christian mentor I ever had was there. And he said something that was so profound to me. He later wrote it in one of his books. Two books that I remember, it might be in one of them. One was Messy Spirituality. The other was Dangerous Wonder. I partnered with this guy. He had a church at a grain hall with 50 people in there. And he didn't take any salary. And he was gone for a couple of weeks a month. I didn't know for the first year what he did. I just knew he was fun and funny. We began hanging out. I went to Bible study at his house. And then he, he did this radio show on Sunday. He asked me to sit in. I got a radio broadcaster, third-class license, under the table. Not proud of it. <laughs> and I would do the radio show. Welcome to KSYC Wairika, right here, 1630 on your radio dial. If you come down in the next 50 minutes, free pizza. <laughs> we did this crazy radio show. Then we did an ad agency together called Hot Air and Associates. Odd name for us, but it was. And we had a lot of fun with it. His name was Mike Iaconelli. I soon learned later he was one of the founders of Youth Specialties. And he's called by cross, Crosswalk.com, the father of modern youth ministry, the biggest youth ministry organization in the world. I didn't know any of that. He's a great guy. But he would tell me stuff like this. And here's something he said to me, and that's what I wanted you to hear about him. He said, love is doing what you don't want to do because you want to do it. Love is doing what you don't want to do because you want to do it. And what's he saying? What the heck does that mean? It's a play on words. It's kind of paradoxical in a way, and here's what he means. It means there's two ways we can love the way Jesus loves, at least two. First, I feel it. The opportunity is there. It's right for me. I'm going to do it. But what if you don't have that feeling? But it's right there. The second way is love when you don't feel like it, but you have a sense it's the right thing to do, and then you choose to do it. And that's the most challenging. It is for me. I choose to make that crazy drive. Sometimes in our work week, we only get one day off. You know, I do lots of things. And that's the day. The last thing I want to do is spend my day doing that. But I actually do. When I pray, and the Lord says, I think it's right for you to do, and I say, okay. So when I drive down, I'm not confused about doing the right thing. I'm not ambiguous. I know it's the right thing. I say, Lord, give me the feeling. Give me the feeling. I get the feeling on the backside. I'm glad I visited her. I'm glad my kids know that I visited her. Everything is legacy, right? 
And I'm always glad I did it. I want all the feelings on the front end, but I often don't get that. I often don't get that. So believers are called, directed, and told they should care for the church, God's people. How do we do it? It's about watching, praying, and seeking opportunities to do what? To serve others in a way that feels natural and pleasing to you? To serve others when it doesn't feel natural and is difficult and challenging. Ask the Lord to give you strength, direction, vision, wisdom, and equipping to do what he sets before you. Where are you with this today? That's between you and the Lord. He knows your heart. Be honest with yourself. There's no shame in any of this. Just be honest. And where are you today? Are you already in serving areas? Are you doing loving the way Jesus loved? Or have you yet to do that? I want to let you know here at Shoreline, we're so committed to this. We have a booth out in the courtyard. I encourage you to go visit it. And some of the Shoreline ministries are represented out there. Grief share, divorce care, lay counseling, um, other ministries that are the military ministry. And you can do two things when you go out there. You can go out there and say, I want to know more and maybe want to serve. Or you can go out there and say, I'm in a place where I need to be served. I need help. How do I get that help? We want to do both. We want you to know that you can do both. Just yesterday in the Parkside room, we had a breakfast for volunteers for the upcoming launch of Celebrate Recovery. August 27th will be opening night. We had 22 people come and volunteer to be part of that ministry. These are people who've been helped, helped and got their lives squared away through the love of Christ through that program. And now they want to give it back. They want to love the way Jesus loves. After this third service, I'll be at the care center next door with our lay counseling team. Why are they doing that? Because they've been helped along the way. Then they got trained to love the way Jesus loved and served. I encourage you today to just pray about that. Visit that booth in the courtyard. Just ask questions and experience what we have there today. So here's what Jesus wants us to know. What will we do with it? The whole world is watching. We're Christians. The whole world is watching. Well, they see us as ambassadors for the one who sent us, Jesus Christ. Loving and serving the way he did. That's up to each one of us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this message. Hallelujah. We just praise you, Lord God Almighty. Thank you so much. Speak to each one of us in here today, myself included. What do you have for us? What do you want from us? What's in front of us? Lord, give me the desire to do it. And if it's not the desire that comes up, Father, give me the will to do what you call me to and then equip me to do it so that I can love the way you love Jesus. We know going to the cross was not easy for you. At one point you said, if this cup be, if it be possible, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Sometimes we feel that way. But we echo his words. Your will be done, not mine. Have your way with us. Thank you for this opportunity to be together this morning. We pray these things in your precious name, Lord. Amen. So before you go today, I got some things to tell you. Next Sunday, next Sunday, our summertime start. Church is now 9 o'clock indoors and 11 o'clock indoors. And at the 9 o'clock service, there'll also be a jumbotron in the courtyard if you want to sit out there and watch the service on that. There'll also be the family worship venue. At 11 o'clock service, it'll be in here. And there'll also be a jumbotron in the courtyard. You can sit out there and watch it if you want. And there'll be family worship service. And online continues. Online continues. So when we meet next Sunday, 9 and 11. Okay, that was a little shaky. That was a little shaky, I got to say. Hello to all you 830 people going, is anybody in there? All right, we have a baptism class at 1 o'clock today in the Peninsula Room right down the hall. And if you're here in the worship center this morning, our prayer team will be up front. I'll be here, others to pray for any needs you have. Please don't be shy, bring them forward. If you're watching online, we have this number you can call. You'll see that number. We have a team standing by ready to pray for you. If you're new today, you can text WELCOME. To 2210290 for our digital connection card. For those of you here in the worship center, would you please, if you're new or recent, you got a lot of questions, go to our connection center straight across over there. Patty would love to answer questions, give you a gift, tell you what's going on here at Shoreline. Um, let's see, I think we have it all. 
And so I'm just so grateful that you're here today with us. Would you please stand? I'd love to just bless you as you go out into your day. May you leave here knowing the Lord is so pleased with the fact that you're in church today. And if you're already serving, know that that service means the world to those you're serving and fills your own heart. And if you're not quite there, will you commit to being open and saying, Lord, speak to me, guide me, direct me. How will I love the way Jesus loved and still loves by serving you? So go out with that in mind and in your heart today, and God bless you. We'll see you again soon.